My name is David Walker. I was born in this house in 1929. It's the same house as my father was born in. I've lived here all my life in Chumagna. Well, my name is Sheila Walker, and I came to live in Chumagna in 1951 when I married David. I wasn't far away then. I was just three miles across the water at Bishop Sutton, but, of course, there was no water then. They were just commencing the building of the lake. I'm Dyer, and I came to Chumagna when I was six months old, and I've lived here ever since. I lived in the cottages by the Queen's Arms, and then we just moved up to here when I got married. We had toilets that you put a bucket of water down the toilet which was something, because lots of people still have bucket toilets. <laughs> so these toilets that you actually could flush, but only yourselves, of course, if you put the bucket of water in, um, that was really quite good. Again, some of the cottages would still have had the bucket toilets, which got to in the river, I think. <laughs> the first nine years we were married, um, we lived in one of David's grandmother's cottages in Silver Street. We had no bathrooms, very few houses had bathrooms, and to the sewerage was put in in 1962. I mean, it's amazing to think of that. And um, my second daughter was born in the cottage, and it, it was very nice having it at home, but there was no, no bathroom, if you can imagine. They wouldn't credit you could have a baby without the bathroom. And there was this row of cottages, there were three cottages, and the loos were along the front of the cottages and there were three lined up round the sides, so you had quite a little hall. No washing machine, of course. I didn't have a washing machine um, when the children were small and you didn't have disposable nappies. My name is Gladys Fanny. I came to Chumagno in 1931. I was married at Chumagno Church and uh, I've lived here ever since. We lived in a thatch. We had tubs to catch the water. The trouble was, the thatch on the roof was too old, but the water was brown with the, with the old thatch, so you couldn't use it for washing. And they had a well there, and we had to uh, we should let the bucket down to the well and bring up, and you drink the water. But then one day we went to bring the bucket up, and there was a great big fluffy floating ball and that was where a big toad or something had fallen in and it was all decomposed and it had whiskers, you know, great long whiskers on. Anyway, uh, my husband uh, had uh, blood poisoning and he had bullets all in his arms and he had to go to hospital and that was condemned, the water was condemned. So then we had to go right down the village. We used to go right down to uh, the co-op, the Amos shop then, and the, there was a village pump there. Some of the cottages have gone, of course, down by the church hall. That was in the 1920s, earth floors and that sort of thing. Mm. So there were some very poor people <coughs> who had the, who lived in one of these cottages. You had a tough life because you didn't have electricity. Because of what electricity came in when I was born, well, soon after I was born. Bishop Sutton. Bishop Sutton. But we didn't have water. You had to fetch the water. And if you lived in one of these cottages on washing day, you had to go to the coal house and get the coal. You had to go to the well and get the water. You had to light the copper at the back of the cottage. You had to pump the washing up and down. And, and you didn't have time to go off playing badminton or <laughs> squash or golf or anything like that. Once we had the, the water laid on, I used to stand by the sink and watch the, wash the vegetables and we watched. Couldn't believe turning the tap on it and for the water to come out. Yeah. In 1939, to meet the ever-increasing demands for water, parliamentary powers were obtained to construct Chu Valley Lake, a reservoir of 4,500 million gallons capacity. The outbreak of war in September of that year made the deferment of the scheme inevitable, and it was not until 1950 that the company obtained permission to embark upon construction. In 1951, work started on the foundations of the dam, and by the end of the year, the whole of the land required for the scheme had been purchased. The clearing of 5,000 trees and 70 miles of hedges from the site had commenced 
and a permanent pumping station was being built. The total cost of the lake and its ancillary works was about one and three quarter million pounds. Alexander Patterson was Bristol Water's chief engineer in 1934. Even then, he saw that Bristol's demands for water would grow quickly. Mr. Patterson visited the Chew Valley and saw the potential for a reservoir to augment nearby Blagdon Lake, which had been built in 1901. When Mr. Patterson came to break the news to my parents and came up to their house, we were all horrified. I mean, he, we stood on the lawn and we could see the area that was going to be flooded. And um, it was this amazing valley that was going to be underwater. We just couldn't believe it. The hamlet of Morton, with its cluster of farm cottages, was demolished. But Stratford Corn Mill was carefully dismantled and rebuilt at Blaze Castle in North Bristol. Well, in our young days, we were lucky enough to have ponies and things like that, and we'd ride through to Bishop Sutton through the part that is now the lake. And I can remember we used to swim in the uh, small kind of stream there, and uh, it was just idyllic, really. My cousins who lived at Chewstoke, all about my age, this was their playground. They used to come to Wally Court Farm and down towards the river, which was out in the middle of the lake now, uh, and swim in the chocolate brown waters of the river. It all seemed very exciting and enjoyable at the time, but um, we used to go home rather messy. In total, some 16 farms and 11 other dwellings were removed to make way for the lake. I am pleased to learn of the particular care which has been taken especially by planting many trees, to heal the scars which must inevitably be left by works of this extent. I congratulate all those who have had a share in the conception, planning and building of the Chew Valley Reservoir, which it now gives me great pleasure to inaugurate. At the commemoration stone, There was one hung gas works, that was opposite the school. The one man gas works, the smallest one in England, run by Mr Sparks, Herbie Sparks. Oh yes, we used to uh, go into school, look to see if the retort was up or down. When we were children, we used to go round to Mr Sparks and get the, the coke for the fire. For, with, our, with a trolley we'd take and get this half a hundred weight of coke. He used to go out on the bench sometimes, and of course the retort was down flat, and, uh, and of course we had to strike a match to light the gas, and, and air come out. There was, no, there was no gas to ignite at all. There was a woman in the village, and she was in a state, she could, tried to commit suicide. She lay down on the floor, put a pillow down on the floor, and uh, turned the gas on, but nothing happened, so it saved her life. <laughs> I can't remember the smell and it didn't seem to, whether it did up in the crescent, just behind it. I suppose we just get used to those kind of 
thing. This would just seem marvellous having gas when lots of mm. people around wouldn't have had it. Uh, we had a shop next door, a grocer's shop, which was started by my father, well, my great aunt actually, in about uh, well, the turn of the century or before then. And my father, he took on the shop by accident. And then I took it on in 1942, and we had it for about 40 years. It was jolly hard work. And uh, David was always at uh, his post on the bacon counter or cooked meats. They used to specialise in cooked meat. He used to cook with his uh, gammons and uh, home cooking. It was beautiful. And cheese, cheeses were good. They, were, I think they got them from shooting men, but they were noted for the cheeses in their hams. And, uh, of course, packaging. There was very little packaging because... It was in the 50s that we hadn't really recovered from the last war. And so things weren't packed very much. We had greaseproof paper for bacon and ham and bags. But biscuits came in big square tins and they were weighed out. Sometimes they were broken, so you sold um, broken biscuits cheaper. And of course, sometimes when you got down the bottom of the tin, they were getting a little bit stale. Nothing was dated, so you had a vague idea of how long it was there, but there certainly wasn't any food poisoning. I don't suppose you'll smell it in shops now, like the cheese and the, all the, the sorted smells that you would get from open goods, like, you know, from the things that were not packaged. My father used to deliver for Amor stores, and the paraffin and the groceries were all in the same van, which wouldn't be allowed today. Next door to where we are was Mrs Hobbs was in the shop then, and she sold everything, I think, for your clothes and wool and all those kind of things. Water spear, which was connected to the, what was now is the bank connected to the, the co-op, he lived in the cottage there, but he was the village blacksmith. I watched the, Mr. Spear, the smithy, shoeing the horses, as well as being a farrier. Of course, he would mend pieces that were brought in by the farmers. He had a window looked out onto the street, and uh, he was often working there at the window. Oh, yes, that was our treat to go and watch the blacksmith shoeing horses. But in his one room, it was the uh, telephone exchange. Also, outside his cottage, or more on the square, there used to be a weighing machine, a big, oh, big enough to, for a lorry to pull on and that sort of thing. And on the side was a hut, and in the hut was a scales, and he used to come out and weigh the machine and write them a ticket. In my time, there were lots of shops. There was the corner shop, Amor stores, Walker stores, Mrs. Hobbs, which was called Hutchings, and the post office, which was Mr. Ward. And the butchers, of course. That was at the top of the high street then. And the bakers, Dander's the bakers. The bakehouse used to actually bake the bread there. And on Saturdays they always made cakes, sponge cakes with icing on and things like that. They used to bring round to the door. The corner shop, that was a sweet shop. And I can remember having the first ice cream that I'd ever tasted in that shop. Mrs Noakes, it was there, made ice cream and we used to go down and have a little glass. There was two cobblers in the village. When I was a child, there was a Mr. Spear who used to mend shoes in the back of his house at the top of the high street. And there was Joe King, and he used to hire the little shop which was attached to Mrs. Hobbs's shop, but is now in a bakery. Also, at one time, that same little place, there was a hairdresser's there. Of course, then there was a hairdresser's where Settler and Lee is now. It was quite a different world for shopping in those days because everyone shopped in the village. It's quite amazing the difference in taste in shopping now. Things like pasta or um, sun-dried tomatoes. No one would know what you were talking about. I joined the co-op in 1958. So I worked then on the old shop boy, heading around Mars or go, Winford, Felton, Norton, Marley Ward. Up so far with the A38 on a shop boat then, which is now in the museum at Radstock. Um, then I was made manager in about 1964. The shop then would be across that area, so five people in the shop, and it was all we, we had to get the grocers four people out. So that, that would have been the, the size of the shop, just running across that angle there. Under now an enlargement now, um, so hopefully for the millennium it should be a nice big store. Like So touch wood, it sort of growed under me. like you know. 
we were the first to have a freezer in the village. We were the first to go self-service. And the day we had all new fixtures put in, it was looking very smart. A lady from one of the large houses came in and said, Oh, you've gone self-service. I'm never coming in here again. And another lady came in and, of course, the counter was gone and there was a long gondola down the middle. And she said, well, how am I going to see you over this? She thought she had to stand the same place and ask for things. So, so it caused quite a bit of confusion, but um, we thought we had to progress. We did progress in, the, in our younger days. We did a lot of work. Of course, the great difference in the village was the lack of cars. It was a great joy, really. We could play on the square without any thought of being run over. We'd just hear a car coming in the distance and just move out of the way. I learned to ride a bike on Harford Square. I can remember going round and round and round one very frosty morning and uh, no fear of traffic at all. My daughter, from the age of four, could walk from Silver Street, or at the age of three and a half, she would walk from Silver Street, um, having been told to take very great care, stepping from the pavement across to another, and she would come out to see her grandmother, and I had no fears at all. Well, I expect, like everybody else, what I don't like is the congestion in the traffic and the noise that is here. But I think it's a wonderful valley, very beautiful valley, and it's, I think, just nice for the sake of the countryside. And You're not too way out in the country, um, and you're near the town if you want to go to Bristol or Bath or anywhere. That's my main liking of it, is that it's a beautiful valley. I mean, it's changed, yes. It's altered, it's different. Yes. It's bound to be different because people don't work here now. I mean, there's you know, there's a lot of trades in the village, like the coal mines and the this, that and the other. Saddlers, we used to have a saddlers down here and all that. But, you know, it's changed, that's inevitable, but I don't think it's deteriorating. We're sorry not to know everyone, I think. Well, that's I right. think that's what we miss. Yeah, well, but that's inevitable, as you say. People, firm, don't firms move people around more, don't they? Yeah. Having a school and having a shop and having a bank and having the doctors and, and I mean you've been able to walk to live in the village and, and, and having all the services, yes, 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 yes. lovely surroundings. And, and and you go down the street here to the shop and the post office or what have you, and you meet somebody and you exchange information or exchange mm. views. We enjoy knowing a lot of people around and we always feel a bit sorry we don't get to know everyone, but you can today because people move around so much. So it's not as much like a village. And I know there's lots of people trying to make it like a village still, but because there are lots of people that just want to live here and not really join in the village, but I suppose when it's so huge, it would be hard to have everyone joining in everything anyway, and that's just sort of part of progress, isn't it? You know, that things change. And if you've lived in a village a long time, I think you're never going to think it's as nice now as it was when you were growing up in it, and I think that would happen anywhere, really. But it's still quite nice place, I think so. <laughs>